Okay, this is part two on the series that we're doing. It becomes a two-parter putting this into it and adding this on to it. For this is the one that we're showing that bread and oatmeal type of products were being made as far back at least as 33,000 BC. It's hooked up in Paglisi Cave. And we're going to discuss more about people that are found in Paglisi Cave also here. And so one wonders whenever you would see these old movies like uh, Raquel Welch and these caveman movies and stuff, or perhaps um, Clan of the Cave Bear and Daryl Hannah looks kind of like this here when that would have happened. And it looks like it goes back reaching towards 50,000 B.C. And we talk about light hair genetics, lighter skin genetics and things like that. There's a big debate nowadays on this type of topic, especially after they found Cheddar Man, and then they said he had somewhat darker skin, and people tried to cover him up with uh, mahogany shoe polish. And, of course, right after that it was refuted. They found someone that was related to him, and he doesn't have very much any effect, although he said he tanned real good whenever he was young and stuff easily. But that would have been a, the effect also. But this light hair and skin gene, whenever they look in genetics and they can tell a dating due to progression in the way it sits in genomes, that it projects about 60,000 BC and goes back as a blanket, 60,000 BC, but goes back as far as a projected number of around 600,000 BC. What's strange about that effect? is that the oldest modern human sapiens, Homo sapiens itself, is 315,000 BC. We found that at Jibal Irud Cave here just about a year and a half ago. Before then it was in the 200,000s and so that w put it way back and then that puts this contrast of course with the timeline and dating of Neanderthal coming about and the weird discussion here is, okay, well, where did Neanderthal all of a sudden come from? And you know, he looked like Chuck Norris type of thing in red hair and his intergression, larger cranial capacity and so on. And these Cro-Magnons had larger cranial capacity also. But at the time, there was also just Homo sapiens and not a Cro-Magnon type, right? But if you look at the 600,000 BC version of that, we're realizing that this type of genetics is projected to go back into at least the European form of Homo sapiens. And further into Homo erectus because at 315,000 we don't cover the span on the projected ideal of how long this interjection came in. I know people have said that all blue-eyed people are related to somebody about 6,800, 8,000, or 10,000 B.C., they say now, that lived around the Black Sea area, but that doesn't mean he didn't have a grandfather, and it doesn't go back way farther than that. There are millions of people that are related to Genghis Khan, right? You've heard this whole thing? But Genghis Khan comes from a lineage, too, and stuff. Yeah, and we've talked about that. So when in a time would there have been a Cro-Magnon woman, much like Daryl Hannah portrays here in Clan of the Cave Bear, and in seeing herself in the reflection, realized that she looked somewhat different than those Neanderthals, and in the video, in the thing, they kind of make fun of her, right? It ends up being an oddity. She's an oddity, but there's a hybrid born from that situation, and then she carries off. Well, who knows what happens, but you could project that as being somewhat the intergression that we talk about now that goes on. At the time of filming the movie, they acted like you didn't make them Neanderthal enough or ape enough, even though you made them slunk around and act weird. Nowadays, we find that, no, that was pretty good. In fact, they didn't have to go that far with it, really, did they? And all those people were dark-haired, whereas we find Neanderthal had red-haired traits in it, perhaps green eyes and things like that. So it would have made them look quite different, too. But Daryl Hannah could have played that part. If Neanderthal is supposed to have lived in Europe beginning around 300,000 B.C., and, of course, there were Homo sapiens at that time, and Cro-Magnon for the last 30,000 years or so, and really it goes back 48,000, 
that's the earliest confirmed point, but because of that blanket situation, it looks like it may go back about 60,000, though we don't have a fossil at this point. So it turns out that their modern DNA is unchanged since that time. So when did we do all that evolving? A Cro-Magnon DNA sequence 28,000 years was obtained from fossil bones discovered at Paglisi Cave, the same place where we have that oatmeal being produced by these people. In Italy, the results show that DNA is identical to DNA sequences of certain modern Europeans today. The DNA sequence has remained static and unchanged for over 28,000 years. So when is this all this evolving happens? Well, you say 28,000 years. In reality, the number is 48,000 years. And people are saying from 50 to 70,000 years was the out of Africa thing. So at what point is this supposed evolving all of a sudden rapid changing happened that all of a sudden doesn't really happen at all? After, how does, does that fit anybody's model? Well, of course, this means that Cro-Magnon was a fully modern individual, perhaps was built more strongly and had a stronger brain capacity, a little taller, we know, of course. And now there's this projection on Denisovans, which we won't really get into in this too much, but just off finger bones and things like that, they're saying this guy could have been much taller. So another possible integration and people have always thought and we were told that that has a lot to do with the islanders and the aborigines and people like that but apparently it's in scandinavian dna and stuff like that some too so it just throws a big loop into that whole concept of where you think skin coloring and things that come from and what denisovans look like i did a video recently where they've made two different versions of them one of them looks like bilbo baggins the hobbit picture and the other one looks somewhat like a Amerindian with a big hooked nose. Bird-like nose, aquiline type nose. But of course, off the fossils that they have at this point, not too much. But some interesting artifacts go along with that. And that's like, wow, they have drilled out things. And they have a, a bracelet that's made of a jade type material that's made to perfection at this time. And if you said it was around in Egypt at that time, they'd still say, man, that's a new part. Look at this. This has got to be like the other things and the schist deals. Look at how they, how do they do this? But it dates way to hell back here. Kind of strange. But these people, you know, they lived like the elves pretty much and didn't have stonework and Neolithic type of work. And whenever you build things out of wood like this, it's long gone perhaps burnt down in forests and things like that. This study, though, went further, and they sequenced the DNA of 123 people who, have caught, who could have possibly been in contact with the fossils since their discovery to rule out contamination by modern humans, and they found, no, it's clear. And what should shut the mouth of the naysaying scientists who were saying and having a wee bit of trouble seeing their caveman vanish into thin air but all of a sudden we realized that, okay, so what you thought was Ugg and Fred Flintstone and all that silly crap comes out to being the same people who are modern humans at 28,000 years ago, at least genetically right there. Now what I found out is that it comes from N and it even has R coming out of the people. And so that's stuff that's been around for so many of a time but then there's another spread of an idea that shows different genetics for that Cro-Magnon sequence in Paglisi cave shows that it's remained static for 28,000 years and of course they had a little bit bigger brain capacity right now than we do about the same margin I believe somewhere around in that as we do to like primitive type people you know like Africans and stuff like that and others Re-examining the out-of-Africa theory and the origin of European Caucasoids in light of DNA genealogy, 7,556 haplogroups or haplotypes of 46 subclads in 17 major haplogroups were considered, and the finding that European haplogroups did not descend from African haplogroups A or B is supported by the fact that the bearers of the European haplogroups, as well as non 
of African haplogroups do not carry all of this list of SMPs right here. And haplogroup and its subclads, SNPs, M60, M180, M90, haplogroup B. There's also a MUC7 gene, MUC7 gene, that they found in their saliva that is not like anyone else. And they say up 20 to 30 percent of their genomes are from an unknown ghost hominid that's not related to any other people on the planet. Now we know about the Neanderthal integration and possible Denisovan integration and how that works out and you think oh well that made Europeans well there's actually more Neanderthal genetics in mongoloid type people in orientals if you will than there is in what you would consider a European type person so that throws that in a loop too and we know that they have Denisovan integration there also but at one time, there was actually two different type of cocosoids that were going on here. It's Homo sapiens, the regular form, and then this seemingly popping up like a popcorn out of Western Europe, and that's where we find all these fossils from. And those two groups of people intergressed, and that made some differences happen and pop up out of it. But also, these people pushed apparently the other forms of Homo erectus and what was left of them into the edges of the earth and had possible integration with them for it seems like that was the thing that brought about people in sub-Saharan Africa. That's for another video. A short time ago in another article earlier this year about Neanderthal man, scientists reported that their DNA sequencing of a 38,000 year old Neanderthal man show his DNA matched modern man by about 99%, 99.99%. That's the same DNA match that exists between any two people living today. In fact, there's more than 8% difference between a far reach of this way and that way. And you're looking at Neanderthal and they're saying it's really not that much different. We only have a strict 1% difference between a chimpanzee actually. If you look at numbers in certain ways and everything, only a 14% difference in a banana, something like that. That being said, science has now found the entire caveman evolutionary myth man made real by portraying Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal man as short, brutish, dumb, and hairy cavemen has been replaced with a new reality, much unlike most of Darwinism is actually backed up by the fossil record. Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal both had larger brains than modern man today and neither were ever found in Africa. Well that's not true they were found in northern Africa and there's remnants of DNA from Cro-Magnon integration and his going all around the entire Mediterranean encapsulating it and the first endemic people of North Africa after a re going into Africa, which happened a few different times. And one of the remnants left of this is a Guanches, who seem to be extremely Cro Magnon related. And they were on the Canary Islands there. And there's little pyramids that are on there and stuff too. There are pyramids all over the Terran Basin and all kinds of places that are related to these type of people in a more modern time than we're speaking of now. Although there are scientists at this very moment who claim that Neanderthal could not even speak. You perhaps heard some of this. That he had no language and he did not interbreed with Cro-Magnon or modern man even. That genetics could just be common or similar. There are still scientists who claim that Cro-Magnon never learned how to ride a horse. These evolutionists refused to come out of the cave. Well, we found horse on the walls at over 22,000 BC and a man is there on them and their best thing that they can go against it is to say well they painted a man standing there and they painted a horse over the top of him and it just looks like he's sitting on these horses just an accident of overlapping their art like they didn't know what the hell they were doing 
far before this we have better art than that cave art there and it looks like realistic depictions too even some of the great artists of the renaissance said wow we did nothing they got the whole thing going on here they know how to represent things pretty well so as enlightening as these findings are, the authors will still claim that these two populations live side by side as much as 10,000 years without interbreeding or that there was only interbreeding at a couple of points possibly and then those people reintegrate back into population or some of them did possibly. Which could seem plausible if you're convinced you're dealing with a pre-human group and a human group. See what I'm saying? More like Neanderthal and aggression, but you look at that and then you say, well, Neanderthal is pretty much here. All these other variations aren't. So this stuff that happened up in Europe was the coming forth of man. And that didn't happen out of Africa. They say the thing happened before that. Well, that gene that we're talking about, that would have to be in the missing link that they just can't seem to find. What if these go back just a little bit further? Then they don't really have anything to connect at all for it starts overlapping with these things that aren't even related to us. If they one day get the genetics out of one of these Lucy-type characters, we're probably going to see something quite different. They'll try to say it's so, so comparative, but when you look at the small comparison and difference between the Neanderthal and then what it will be compared to, you'll find that no, no, that's not even... Maybe it's got something to do with Homo erectus, but not these people. Oh, it'll take them a while, and they'll go through all this crap, and different people will probably go back and forth on it. It'll become the thing that's heard about in the hush-hush for 10 years, and then comes out. DNA sequences from ancient specimens may in fact result from undetected contamination of the ancient specimens by modern DNA, and the problem is particularly challenging in studies of human fossils fossils doubts on the authenticity of the available sequences have so far hampered genetic comparisons between anatomical archaic neanderthal and early modern cro-magnon europeans but they've got the sequences and so and now they should be able to do this and in fact you would believe by now someone's done some of this work but they haven't been able to come to a conclusive thing or sure as hell they don't want to come out with it. Methodology and principal findings. We typed the mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA, hypervariable region 1 in a 28,000-year-old Cro-Magnon individual from the Paglisi cave in Italy. Contains that bread and oatmeal type stuff, yep. And all the people who had contacted the sample since discovery in 2003, the Paglisi 23 sequence determined through the analysis of 152 clones is the Cambridge reference sequence and cannot possibly reflect contamination because it differs from all potentially contaminating modern sequences that they used for those that could be connected to it. The Paglisi 23 individual carried an empty DNA sequence that is still common in Europe which radically differs from those of the most contemporary Neanderthals, demonstrating a genealogically continuity across 28,000 years from Cro-Magnon, God, to modern Europeans. I hope this coffee kicks in. Because all potential sources of modern DNA and contamination are known, the Paglisi 23 sample will offer a unique opportunity to get insight for the first time into the nuclear genes of early modern humans and well Europeans Caucasians if you will and so at that same point you'd have to say well if they're still viable today then how does that all work and we say N comes from that and come and E comes from CT and the time dating of that and how they overlap and then there was a big change going on of integration and things that happened back at this timeline dating somewhere between say 26,000 BC and 
something important happening about 40 it looks like now I'm sorry 50 48 50,000 BC before now before that there were anatomically correct humans such as this representation of Homo erectus but they have a much smaller brain capacity and their integration with a Neanderthal intergressed Cro-Magnon type some 26 to 30,000 years ago imparted them with a larger cranial capacity and people have determined that that probably for they haven't pegged it down totally is what led to modern sub-Saharans of certain forms and then there's the Khoisan and they found those have integration archaic and closer to a modern time that formed them and they're not actually related to others like Bantoid type people or not oh, Saharans aren't related to those but all of those contain an integration that isn't involved in any of the other people. Now being the fact that Cro-Magnon had been around for a projected 48,000 BC and there's no other form other than Peking man that comes close to even a modern form and that's like a Homo erectus form it looks like integration of these two and Denisovans in a weird mix of different mixes integrating with far pressed out people to the edges of the earth formed their forms too and then that's why our modern genetics look so similar it's because most of it comes from these people whose haplogroups and genetics if you go back a couple of steps start making connections and they've already made this type of connection before it's part of what they use in a modern day say well we all come from the same place but if you look at this and the amount of difference there is there's as much as difference of a dog and a wolf and a jackal going on here and y'all well they're closely related somewhat yeah well there's a jackal that we just now about six years ago figured out no that's a wolf and it took modern genetics for looking at him genetic wise craniometry everything but that they were still convinced it was quite the jackal did a video on it just for a comparison of thought of concepts of how close something could be and then called the exact same thing whenever you look those up and one's not even on the other, same tree as the other one and so on and the variation and difference of that so reality versus what a modern teaching is I guess you'd say but roughly 30,000 years ago a genetics that is still extant today you I mean you can still find it in modern humans European types so what they look like well they, they look like this and some of their women look like this and this and this and it's gone basically unchanged for 30,000 years that kind of throws a wrench in the whole little idea and the rapid evolution and the possibilities of what we've been trying or told to believe is the way it went can't have gone that way in any way shape or form do you understand what I'm showing that's it for this one let's go on need to check out Robert Sepper's videos if y'all haven't yet I don't agree with everything that he says but Quite a lot of his archaic teachings and his stuff that goes with sacred geometry and things like that that I found that he has now go quite well. He's working off folklore and things just like me too. It's just he does a more modern interpretation of some other things too that I don't even really want to get into because it gets too personal. But I found a lot of what he says is also true, especially his 1666.
Peace.